Woodworking tools need to be sharp to work to their maximum potential. I've got several chisels and hand planes here, a card scraper, and a cabinet scraper, all of which need to be sharpened. Stick around and I'll show you how I get these tools super sharp. I'm Greg Swenson and this is the Swenson Wood Shop. Thanks for selecting my channel. If you're not already subscribed, be sure to click the subscribe button and then that little bell to be notified when I upload new videos. This is the first video in a four-part series on how to sharpen woodworking tools. Sharpening is one of those basic woodworking skills I wrestled with when I first started woodworking more than 40 years ago. And to be honest, it took me a long time before I finally figured it out. If only YouTube had been around back then, I could have watched a video just like this and saved myself a lot of trial and error. There's a lot of material to cover, so I thought I'd break this down into four separate videos to make it easier for viewers to watch or re-watch the specific tools they need to sharpen. In this first video, we'll briefly cover the concept of a zero radius edge and the basic steps and rules I follow to get a zero radius edge. Then I'll show you the equipment I use and how to flatten whetstones. In part two, we'll go through each of the steps needed to sharpen a bevel chisel, a mortise chisel, a corner chisel, and a fishtail chisel. Part three, we'll cover each of the steps needed to sharpen a plain iron. They're not exactly the same as a chisel, and we'll also look at how to set up a hand plane to get the best results from that sharp edge. And finally, in part four, I'll show you how to sharpen a card scraper and a cabinet scraper. They're actually not the same tool. If your hand tools are really sharp, they're a joy to use and are probably your go-to tools when you have a task not well suited to a power tool. If they're not sharp or tuned correctly, you probably avoid these tools like the plague, trying desperately to find a way to use a power tool for a task it's just not suited for. This can lead to accidents or at a minimum, possibly a trip back to the lumber rack. I'm not gonna get into the theory of metallurgy and bevel angles. Let's just accept that people a lot smarter than me have designed the tools and materials correctly and let's concentrate on how to maintain the cutting edge. Speaking of people smarter than me, here's a book I'd like to recommend to anyone interested in learning far more than this video series will give you. The Perfect Edge by Ron Hawk. If you take anything away from this first video, I hope it's the concept of a zero radius edge. If we looked at a cutting edge under a high magnification, we would see that a cutting edge is formed where the bevel surface and the back surface intersect with zero radius. Now a true zero radius edge is a theoretical concept that can never be achieved because metal molecules have physical size and higher magnification will always reveal a radius, even if it were possible to sharpen an edge to only one molecule in thickness, which is not. Still, the concept represents our goal to bring both surfaces as close to a zero radius edge as is reasonably practical for our intended use. Let me put this in more practical terms that we can actually apply to sharpening. A cutting edge is not the bevel surface, nor is it the back surface. It's the intersection of both surfaces. So if you hone and polish the bevel surface, but not the back surface, You've only sharpened half the edge. The other half is still dull. Sharpening generally consists of three basic steps. Grinding, honing, and polishing. I sometimes think it's sort of like pizza dough. Pizza dough is pretty much made universally using the same basic ingredients. So why, if everyone uses the same ingredients, are some pizza crusts so much better than others because it's how you combine the ingredients that makes the difference. Sharpening works the same way. 
It's the how you grind, hone, and polish that makes a difference between really sharp and, well, it can cut pizza, but enough silliness. There are two rules that I follow when sharpening. Rule one, both intersecting surfaces must be polished. And rule two, don't move to the next finer grit until you feel the burr. I'll talk more about each of these in the part two through four step-by-step -step videos. I like to hollow grind my chisels and plane irons. I know there's a lot of debate online on the merits of hollow versus flat grinding. Get a group of woodworkers together and you'll hear as many different opinions and approaches to sharpening as you have individuals in the group. But sooner or later, all woodworkers will need to grind their cutting edges because the edge is damaged or the micro bevel is no longer a micro bevel. Regardless of the reason, when faced with the task of removing a significant amount of metal to restore the edge for honing, you can either hone the primary bevel for a really long period of time, or you can use a grinder or some other coarse abrasive to rapidly remove the metal. If you have a conventional grinder with the wheels oriented in the vertical axis, you're going to be hollow grinding. If you have a grinder with the wheels oriented in the horizontal axis, or if you use a belt sander, sandpaper, or coarse bench stone, you're flat grinding. Whether you used a power grinder or a hand-powered method, you're still grinding. So much of the debate over flat versus hollow grinding is just background noise, and the difference really boils down to which tool are you using for grinding. I happen to have a bench grinder set up with CBN wheels that I use a lot for sharpening my wood turning tools, so hollow grinding is a convenient option for me. However, I prefer hollow grinding to flat grinding for several reasons. First, it reduces the amount of steel I need to hone and polish. With a hollow ground bevel, I'm only honing a narrow margin at the cutting edge while preserving the option to either hone at the original primary bevel angle or at a higher angle micro bevel. I also think hollow ground bevels require less frequent regrinding as repeated honing increases the width of the bevel, mainly because of the difference in frictional resistance to the movement of the blade between bevels ground at a primary bevel angle versus a higher angle micro bevel. I also grind my chisels and plane irons several degrees less than the bevel angle, which eliminates the flat margin at the heel of the bevel, commonly used by freehand sharpeners to help register the bevel to the surface of the stone. I use a honing guide, and I don't sharpen freehand, so I don't need or want that second flat margin for registering the blade to the surface of the whetstone. For me, that second flat margin is just more steel to hone and a waste of my time and effort. A single flat margin right at the cutting edge is all I need. However, if you're interested in freehand sharpening, you probably want to center the hollow grind to keep a small flat at the heel of the bevel. I'll talk more about this in the part two and three videos. Over the years, I've tried a number of different systems, jigs, guides, and abrasive types, trying to find a system that would consistently produce a superior edge with a minimum of effort. Here's some of the stuff I've accumulated over the years. Here we got an electric water stone. This was useful for sharpening joiner and planer knives. Here's a jig that I used to use for sharpening joiner knives on sandpaper. Diamond stones, diamond lapping plates, metal polish, honing compound, oil stones, silicon carbide stones. Here's a little jig for sharpening the chisels on my hollow chisel mortising machine. Here's a Veritas jig with this little indexing attachment that's useful for setting the protrusion of the chisel or plain iron out of the jig. And a clips 
honing guide. I think this is a Keller honing guide. I, had, I don't use this very often because it doesn't expand wide enough for holding my plane irons. Here's a nice little jig. This is a Bridge City jig. has a little guide here for setting the blade in there square. And you can change the angle by rotating this knob on the back, which changes the angle. Nicely made. And then there's my current setup. It consists of a diamond lapping plate, ceramic whetstones from 320 grit through 12,000 grit, a honing guide with replaceable jaws for different blade types, a homemade angle setting jig, a thin stainless steel ruler, a spray bottle of water, and camellia oil. I gave up on trying to freehand sharpen a long time ago, and I now use a honing guide for all my bevel surface work. Some people can sharpen without a guide, but I've never been able to master that muscle memory skill. I've tried over the years, but I think this old dog is stuck using this, a honing guide. For those of you who have mastered that skill, you get an atta boy or an atta girl. Good job. I hone and polish using ceramic whetstones. I tried the diamond stones, the oil stones, the water stones, sandpaper, and I finally settled on ceramic whetstones. It was a subjective decision influenced by a number of factors. Diamond stones seem to lose their aggressiveness over time, much like worn sandpaper does. Oil stones cut too slowly, and water stones, they got to be stored in a tub of water. Ceramic wet stones don't require soaking in water. A simple spritz with a spray bottle of water is all that's needed. They produce a good swath or slurry, exposing new sharp particles as they're used, and they can sharpen the hardest of steels. They do, however, require regular flattening. I also don't use a strope or polishing compounds, mainly because I use wet stones through 12,000 grit. And I think the benefits I might gain with further polishing are a diminishing return. I just don't need my edges sharpened to the nth degree. The nth minus one is working fine for me. There's also the issue of possibly rounding that zero radius edge if you're not careful. With that being said, if you like using a strope and polishing compounds, then keep on trucking if that's the method that's working for you. So much of the question of what equipment to purchase really boils down to a couple of questions. The more difficult and subjective, which in your experience works best for you, and the easier, objective, what's your budget? So before I can begin honing and polishing, I need to make certain my whetstones are flat. I have a diamond lapping plate that I use to flatten my whetstones. The manufacturer recommends not using it on whetstones coarser than 500 grit, so I use a coarse diamond stone when flattening my 320 grit whetstone. I'll put a pencil squiggle mark on each stone and head over to the utility sink. To flatten the whetstone, we just need to rub the lapping plate against the whetstone until the pencil marks are gone. A little bit more. Okay. 
that's pretty good. There we go. Easy peasy. So that's the process for flattening the whetstones. It wasn't very complicated and it didn't take much time. But it does make a difference in getting consistently sharp edges. I guess you could say it's one of the steps required if you're using whetstones to make world-class pizza dough. Of course, if you didn't watch the entire video, you have no idea what the heck I'm talking about. I've got four brand new chisels here, and in part two of this video series, I'll demonstrate the step-by-step -step process to get each of these tools sharp and ready for use. I'm Greg Swenson, and this has been the Swenson Woodshop.